It is an honor to welcome Dr. Anna Carter Florence to Princeton Seminary. Dr. Florence is a double alumna of our seminary, having earned both her MDiv and PhD here. So today we're pleased to welcome her home. She currently serves as the Peter Marshall Professor of Preaching at Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta. She is an ordained pastor in the PCUSA, and formerly served on the staff of the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis. Dr. Florence's research focuses on creative strategies for communities to engage and encounter the Bible. And her recent book, Rehearsing Scripture, Discovering God's Word in Community, Dr. Florence compares the work of reading scripture to Christian community to the world of the theater. She explains that like a repertory, repertory theater company that performs the same plays again and again over many years in one community, so too the church does similar work. She says, when we enter scripture together over time with people with whom we share a life, space, and a community, we're able to do the work better. We're able to enter the text more deeply and ask harder questions. In her preaching and teaching and her scholarship, Anna Carter Florence is constantly helping the church to enter the sacred text more deeply and to ask the right questions. As part of the Donald McLeod Preaching Lectureship, Dr. Florence preached yesterday at the Community Congregational Church of Short Hills. Earlier today, she led a student workshop entitled, When Preachers Go Where the Wild Things Are. <laughs> this evening, her lecture is entitled, Scripts in the Scripture for Bent Double Days. Would you join me in welcoming Anna Carter Florence? It's such a joy and a privilege to be with you. I am so grateful to President Barnes for the invitation to come and to the homiletics faculty, my dear colleagues, I was Cleo's TA, um, and to the Community Congregational Church in Short Hills and their pastor, uh, Dr. Johan Bosman, for endowing this and for hosting me yesterday. And to Dr. McLeod, who had retired by the time I got here, but ate lunch in the refectory every day in the dining hall. So I knew who he was, and he was more of a friend of my husband, David, but I did know him. But mostly, it's a real happiness for me to be back on this campus where so many key moments of my life unfolded. I met my husband, David, the second day of my first year in the president's house reception and orientation. I found the great teachers of my life here, and I found my vocation as pastor and preacher and now teacher of preachers. And I think I have walked every inch of this campus. I was doing that last night and today. And when I came back for the PhD and was pregnant with our second son, I waddled every inch of this campus. A piece of my heart is always going to be here. So this afternoon, it's not so much a lecture as it is what I'm going to do, a series of home movies or family videos about us. In my work, I do a lot of preaching to preachers. It's a peculiar context to do that. And when I do, the preachers who are there for these kinds of events and conferences are often bent double. I mean, not just the bent over woman, bent double. And so I began some years ago to read scripture differently. I began looking for the preacher in the text, always, and finding that there were scripts in the scripture for us and for who we are. So because I read Frederick Buechner's Peculiar Treasures when I was growing up, I borrowed his structure of alphabetical entries and some years ago began to write a book in which I 
began reflecting on images in the biblical text as if they were for preachers. And the working title, I'm about two-thirds, three-quarters through. The working title is A is for Alabaster, a preacher's alphabet. There were going to be 26 entries, and then it was hard to choose. So now there are 52, 26 Hebrew Bible, 26 New Testament. Uh, so this is um, some new work, and the images are of us and of our life. So the letter F. When you start a biblical project based on the alphabet, what you find right away is that everyone's name seems to start with J. So you have a hard time fitting people in. Um, you have to find a way to spread it out. Jacob, Job, Jeremiah, John, Jesus. So Jonah got F, fish. F is for fish. Preachers love a fish story with some bite to it. And that's a good thing, too, because there's so many to choose from. Loaves and fishes, fishing for people, cast your net on the right side of the boat, come and have breakfast, bring some of the fish that you just caught. A preacher could midrash all day on one of those. You'd have yourself a nice set of homiletical images, eminently suitable for the pastoral life. For example, you could say, this morning, all I have to bring to the pulpit is a few loaves and fish, but with God's blessing, it will feed this crowd, and that, my dear friends, is my image of what it is to preach, offering my own small lunch in the hope that God will make it a feast. That's one interpretation, a lovely one, and if you want to stop there, please feel free. But I would like to direct our attention to another fish in Scripture. A big one. Some fish aren't ours to catch. Some fish are sent to catch us on the way to the pulpit. And I refer, of course, to the book of Jonah. But the Lord provided a large fish, not a whale, a large fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out on dry land. Jonah never wanted to be a prophet, and that in itself isn't a bad thing. As the saying goes, never trust a prophet who signs up for the job. On the other hand, when God calls, it is time to go, and this is where Jonah gets into trouble. He goes, all right, but in the opposite direction. God has to chase him down to the coast and all the way out to sea. There are special effects including gale force winds, capsizing ship, as God swiftly and decisively demonstrates that Jonah's prophetic assignment is not, in fact, optional, and that it would be fruitless to hide before below deck or at the world's end in Tarsus. Jonah finally gives in. He allows the crew to toss him overboard, clearly expecting that this is it. He's about to die. That's what you get when you refuse to obey the call of God, it isn't. What you get is a big fish whose verb is to swallow up. You, that is. To be swallowed up is not the friendliest of human experiences. It comes to each of us eventually, but through less tangible agents than sea creatures. Anxiety, anger, sorrow, guilt, pride, fear. Each of those is capable of swallowing us up and carrying us long distances in the dark and the wet to places we never wanted to go where God feels as far away as Sheol. But to be swallowed up by a big fish is different. To begin with, it's a saving device. Without the fish, we would be lost to the waves and dead in the water. The fish is a, life draft, is a life raft sent from God as surely as day follows night. It just happens to be more pointedly metaphorical, cramped, slippery, and filled with fish guts. You won't be able to move, stand, or see the hand in front of your face, and you definitely won't be able to steer or navigate, which is the whole point. The big fish 
is the perfect holding pen for preachers who are pretending they can't hear what God is calling them to say and who need some time to think about it, in Jonah's case, three days, before something far worse can drag them down and swallow them whole. Since the big fish is only a temporary shelter, there must be an exit strategy, so God sends the fish a new verb as soon as a little dry land becomes available. After the swallowing out comes, so after the swallowing up comes the spewing out. Notice that we aren't cast back into the waves to drown, but we don't exactly get a hero's welcome on the beach either. The fish spews us out. It literally hurls us back into our lives. There's nothing graceful about this, as anyone who has suffered a bout of the stomach flu knows. It's regurgitation with fish guts. It's salvation by projectile vomiting. There's nothing else to do but pick up your pride, wash off the mess, thank God for another chance to go to Nineveh, where no one really wants to go, but where we're all sent from time to time, after sitting a spell in the big fish, that is. Swallowed up and spewed out. Is it any wonder so many preachers over the years have identified with Jonah? It isn't his initial running away that hits home with us, although most of us have tried that. It's that his verbs are so laughably ineffectual. You can't run away from God's call to speak any more than you can hide in fig leaves. You can't set sail for Tarsus any more than you can walk to Mars. You can't hide below deck in a storm when there's work to do. God will send a big fish to find you each week if necessary. And in this story, it's the fish that has the verbs to get us where we need to go. It's the fish that saves us from fear and mediocrity and spite so that we can be the preachers God has called us to be. Swallowed up and spewed out. The next time you find yourself on the receiving end of one of these verbs, ask yourself if a big fish is involved. Maybe it isn't a case of anxiety or anger or sorrow getting the upper hand. Maybe God has a word for you to speak in Nineveh, a word that you are taking a little too long to say. Feel around with your feet. If those are fish guts slopping under your shoes, chances are you're on your way to the beach in the belly of a fish, and it's for your own good. Best not to fight it. Hunker down, use the time to get your head on straight, pray like Jonah, sing like Jonah, and prepare for a wet landing. I am a slow writer, very slow, but this next piece I wrote in two hours, sitting at my sister's kitchen table in New Hampshire during the Supreme Court confirmation hearings last fall for Brett Kavanaugh after the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford. This is E is for Esther. Esther shows up once in the revised common lectionary in year B, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, proper 21 or 26. Perhaps that's commentary in itself. Maybe the opportunities for us to step up and lean into a great act of courage come around so seldom that we only get one or two in a lifetime. Maybe those moments of courage turn out to make a difference for hundreds or even thousands of people. Maybe, for that reason, they're remembered as great acts of heroism, even if it's never what we intended. In which case, the issue seems to be, will we recognize a singular moment and seize it when it comes? Will we find the courage to do that, step into a void with no guaranteed outcome, or will we hesitate just long enough for the moment to pass us by beyond recall. 
How do preachers, how do we, live in such a way that courage is available to us when we need it? There are no formulas, as Esther's story so aptly illustrates. She never asked for heroism. She never asked to be born into an empire hostile to her Jewish faith. She never asked to lose her parents and be raised by her uncle Mordecai, no matter how kind and wise he was. She never asked to be selected as a replacement queen in a kingdom-wide beauty contest meant as a royal distraction after the former queen's courage ended up publicly embarrassing the king. CV is for Vashti. And she never asked for Haman, the king's hell-bent on revenge advisor, to manipulate the monarch into signing an edict to destroy all the Jews in the empire simply because his ego was threatened by one man who refused to bow to him. Esther's uncle Mordecai bowed to no one but the Lord of the universe, and Haman, who felt entitled to Mordecai's deference and subjugation was enraged by it. He conceived a plan that played into public xenophobia and nationalism. Because Mordecai dared to stand, all Jews would pay the price. They would all be annihilated. Esther never asked for that, and she certainly never asked to be trapped in the middle of an insane power struggle for male dominance in the court, a struggle that because of one man's rage quickly ramped up to the specter of full-blown genocide. From the confines of the harem, Esther felt deflated and defeated enough to go down into silence. What could one woman do in her position to stop an imperial juggernaut? Why should, she they, why should she think they would ever listen to her? Mordecai suggested she reframe the issue. Don't think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence as, at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise from another quarter, but you and your father's house will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you've come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. The issue isn't whether we have enough power to confront injustice. It's whether we recognize that it's time to step up and try. Time to speak. Time to preach. Time to use Whatever we have at our disposal, even if it's a set of royal robes and a tiara, or a clergy collar and a pulpit, that could work too. Esther recognized her moment when it came around. Even more amazing, she seized it. And because of that, we remember her as one of the greatest heroines of her time and ours, a woman who stepped out of obscurity and hiding, which is what her name means, Esther literally means, I am hiding, into a blazing spotlight of uncertain outcomes. There were no guarantees that she would succeed. There were no guarantees that she would survive. There was simply the imperative of the moment and the truth and the hope that her voice would be heard. Maybe she was sent to the kingdom for such a time as that. Maybe she did have enough courage to take a deep breath and use what she had. Esther doesn't surface much in Christian lectionary cycles. But our Jewish sisters and brothers have the right idea. Read the whole book out loud and in worship. Do it every year. Make it a festival. Call it Purim. Get the children involved with costumes and parades. Raise them with the expectation that the story of Esther isn't optional 
or occasional. It's written into our life. It's written into our faith. And it will come up each year, and then again in each life. And we have all that we need to play it. The letter L. So preachers and teachers of preachers have to consider practical matters. It's one of our least favorite things to do, but we have to form, language, imagery. And an alphabet of scripture has to include somewhere the book of Revelation. So here is the letter L for Laodicea. In the big wide world of aspirational adjectives, lukewarm doesn't usually make the cut. Social awareness campaigns don't encourage girls to be bold, confident, fearless leaders by launching hashtag lukewarm like a girl initiatives. The military doesn't recruit soldiers with slogans like be all that you can be, lukewarm. Preachers don't send their flocks out the door with the charge, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lukewarm. Think about these things. The truth is that unless you're a bottle of baby formula or yeast activating in water, lukewarm is the last thing you want to be, unless tepid, half-hearted, indifferent and unenthusiastic also appeal to you and seem like adjectives you might use to brighten up a resume or an online dating profile. <laughs> and here we have an excellent case study of how imagery works in context. Lukewarm may be a very undesirable descriptor for us, but in Laodicea, it conjured up very different associations. Laodicea was a city on the river Lycus in Phrygia, home to one of the seven churches in Asia mentioned in the book of Revelation. The city had wealth and sophistication, thriving commerce, every luxury, but a serious water problem, including a lack of drinking water. A splendid aqueduct was built to pump water from neighboring towns to address the problem. Hot mineral waters springs through one set of pipes, cold mountain springs through another. But by the time the water reached Laodicea, it was no longer hot or cold. It was lukewarm and calcified from its journey through the pipes. It wasn't refreshing to drink or even fit to drink, and certainly not restorative, no. It was water that made you want to gag, like reaching for a mug of steaming hot coffee or a bottle of your favorite iced soft drink and discovering on the first gulp that it's been sitting out for hours, room temperature and flat, with this weird aftertaste of Chalk? To the citizens of Laodicea, lukewarm wasn't just another term for ambivalence. The very word made them want to spit, or worse, it literally described the bilge they got every time they opened the taps. So what better way to get the attention of the church in Laodicea but to take their least favorite adjective, the one guaranteed to provoke an, provoke an immediate physical reaction, and put it on the lips of the Prince of Peace. You know, it takes a writer of exceptional skill and prowess to use imagery the way the author of the book of Revelation does. We could go on for days. Seven lampstands, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, angels and dragons, thrones and beasts, horses and riders, alpha and omega, the lake of fire, the marriage supper of the lamb, and a new heaven and a new earth, and the jeweled city of God. That writing is pure genius, and so is the use of imagery, and it stirs and moves and enthralls and terrifies us all at the same time. It also uncovers truth, which is what apocalyptic writing aims to do, and what apocalypse means in its original sense, an unveiling, a revealing, 
a disclosing of what has long been hidden. No matter how discomforting or shocking or objectionable that truth might be, apocalyptic aims to inflame. We can only imagine that the members of the Church of Laodicea experienced a fair amount of shock when they first heard the book for the first time, even had serious objections to parts of it. The same might go for the churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. The text has choice words for each. But the author saved the best and the wickedest imagery for last, as writers often do. And we can only hope that the church in Laodicea heard it in the end, that their riches and privilege and allegiance to empire values were corroding the gospel. Their church was like water traveling through chalk encrusted pipes, not fit to drink. And they needed to pay serious attention to it because the author warned at the moment they were seriously compromised. Jesus himself found them as vomit inducing as their own city water. They were lukewarm. And that word for them must have generated this great collective cringe. The imagery we use as preachers has the power to unveil truth, often with more expedience and efficiency than words or speech. And those images change from context to context. Words that evoke a shudder in one place, drawing on a collective memory of some painful or joyful experience, they may elicit no reaction whatsoever in another. Or they may be misconstrued and drained of their original power, which is precisely what has happened with this lukewarm image. Readers today could easily assume that this text means to be a corrective for widespread apathy or lackluster faith, but that's, that's not it, exactly. Christ isn't reminding us to be enthusiastic for the gospel. He's pleading with us not to corrode it. And the author of the text is counting on the Laodicean communal consciousness and gag reflex to do its work. Are we so dazzled by wealth, so captive to its pursuit, that we can no longer be a conduit for God's justice? Have we become as lukewarm and contaminated as our city water supply? Or, God help us, have we built a church as malfunctioning and ill-conceived as our state-of-the-art imperial aqueduct, the pride of Rome, and a misery to everyone who lives here? Preaching in an apocalyptic mode has always gained momentum from wild and woolly imagery. But maybe, maybe it works best with homegrown images. When we have a hard word, an unveiling word, an uncovering word to speak, what would it mean for us to search our shared memory and experience for the images that already speak loudly in our communities? For instance, to you, the churches and hurricanes threatened coastal areas. You've become highways that lead in only one direction, away from the storm. Why are you abandoning those left behind in the hurricane's path? Or, you, the churches in water-parched desert cities, you are empty reservoirs who've been drained too quickly for frivolous reasons. Why are you wasting precious water to green your suburbs when the earth around you is so thirsty? And you, the churches along Great rivers, you are the cities upstream who consume so much water that nothing's left for those downriver. Why do you feel entitled to more than your share? And you, the churches in glacial mountains and geothermal pools, you are hidden hot springs known only to locals. Why have you turned inward and jealously guarded the grace that belongs to everyone? And you, the churches in industrial cities, you are leaded pipes running under the city, slowly poisoning the drinking water of children and the poor. Why do you tell lies? 
to protect your name and sacrifice the most vulnerable among us. Those are words of judgment revealing hard truths, but we Laodiceans need to hear them loud and clear before any of us can enter the jeweled city of God. We have to tend to what is most wretched in us, pitiable and poor, as the text puts it. Only then will we know the riches Christ offers, gold refined by fire, anything but lukewarm. The letter G. I was at a conference this month that had some lectures on preaching and climate change. And one of the speakers shifted our focus away from church decline with this simple question. He said, can you see that when the earth is on the brink of ecological disaster in 20 years, can you see that God might want to get our attention with shrinking numbers so that we will have to do things differently, preach things differently, because our old way of preaching has enabled this disaster. After that lecture, I made a promise to myself to read texts as if Greta Thunberg is sitting on my shoulder. So G is for Goliath. Goliath of Gath was the Philistine giant that no one in Israel wanted to fight, and for good reason. The man was a behemoth. He stood nearly 10 feet tall, his whole body was covered with bronze, and he carried a spear as big as a tree. He also yelled a lot. He came out to the battlefield every day and yelled at the Israelite army to send them one of their own to fight so they could settle this long dispute between the Philistines and King Saul once and for all. But there were never any takers. The Israelites were terrified of him. Every morning and evening, Goliath would come out and shout his defiance, and the Israelite army would turn and run. It was a matter of national shame and it went on for 40 days. Intimidation, as every bully knows, is a powerful instrument. If you can make all those around you believe they don't have what it takes to stand up to you, you can defeat an army just by yelling at it. You can also depress a preacher who is facing the prospect of proclamation. Preachers know Goliath really well. He shows up regularly when we sit down to prepare our sermons, and he stamps his foot and shakes his spear and yells at us about everything, how small we are and weak and naive and unfit for ministry and terrible preachers with no skill for exegesis, no depth, no style, no voice, no prayer of pulling together a sermon anyone will want to hear, even Jesus is going to hate, and it is very loud, all this yelling, Headphones will not block it because now Goliath has a Twitter account. He yells and tweets morning and night with a purpose to distract us, to turn our attention from the text to him. If he can get us to fight back using weapons rather than the word, he knows he'll have us. If he can provoke us into returning insult for insult and sword for sword, our sermons will be as empty as he says they are. So what's a preacher to do when Goliath makes his appearance, which he does and will? The text has a suggestion. Get in touch with your inner adolescent. Adolescents have acute sensibility factors when it comes to bullies. They meet them every day. They are also adolescents developmentally programmed to overestimate their own strength in all things, which makes them, one, vulnerable, two, irrepressible, and three, invincible. Is it any wonder that justice movements the world over rely on youth to fuel their revolutions? Adults may quail 
but an adolescent at the peak of her idealism will believe herself fit for the task of slaying a giant. A teenager who weighs less than Goliath's armor will dare to take him on. It's the gift of the age. And make no mistake, it is a spiritual gift. The teenager who becomes a giant killer in this story is a young David fresh from the sheep pasture where he's been consigned to look after the flocks and stay out of trouble. Or so his family thinks. Actually, shepherding is a dangerous business, and David's been learning all kinds of survival skills with a slingshot. His older brothers may be in the army, but David does battle of his own every day with the predators of this world who threaten God's flocks, lions, and bears that are just part of the landscape. So a boy steps up, and he is shocked, shocked that no one in Saul's army has stepped up to meet Goliath, who isn't even a lion. He's just a man in a bear suit with an iPhone. Who are these adults? Philistines at our door. Global disaster. And why does no one in Israel trust that God can defeat the one really loud one who is daring us to take him on? So David volunteers. No one else will. He assures King Saul that despite his youth and inexperience, he is fully capable of dealing with Goliath. How can it be otherwise if God and the truth are with him? The boy is as buoyant as the adults are grim. And none of them expect him to survive. But that is their age-related challenge. Adults are developmentally programmed to be drearily realistic. It's why Saul offers David state-of-the-art battle gear, bronze helmet, coat of mail, because that's the adult way, to saddle a kid with more weight than he can carry. But David knows better. You cannot dismantle a giant with his own tools, and you definitely cannot walk in his own armor. The outcome is predictable. David fells Goliath with one well-aimed stone, which no one believed was possible, and he does it without the trappings of grown-up warfare. He won't wear armor that isn't his. He won't carry weapons he doesn't know. He just goes to meet the giant with the familiar things he relies on every day. Some stones, a slingshot, the word of God. Sometimes the humblest, most basic things are all you need to meet a very loud giant and shut him up. Preachers who were intimidated by the latest bullies on the block or in our heads need to reread this story. If we believe Goliath, he will always win. If we take Saul's armor, we won't get far. The way to fell a giant is with a well-placed proclamation, the word set loose by a slingshot, or maybe a sign held high in the hands of a teenage girl while the rulers of this world look on. So the letter X, nothing starts with X, nothing starts with X, but it is in some words. And I'm interested in how communities engage scripture, how we encourage and inspire one another to gather around the table, read the Bible as a living word, a wild thing, maybe have a wild rumpus. So here's a story for that. X is in Acts, A-X, not A-C-T-S. X, yeah, X is in Acts, Hebrew Bible. Some stories just have that X factor, that certain something. They appeal to multiple audiences across generational, generational and theological differences. They inspire readers from every corner to weigh in with their interpretive two cents. This little story of Elisha and the X in 2 Kings 6 is a perfect example. You know this, Elisha succeeded his mentor, the great and singular Elijah, as the next prophet in Israel. He had big shoes to fill, 
Once Elijah was taken up into heaven in a cinematic display of splendor, flaming chariots, angelic escorts, Elisha was left to pick up the mantle and carry on the work of his predecessor. He was certainly keen for it. He had prayed with fervor for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. But like most next in lines, he'd underestimated what the job would entail. Political intrigue, palace drama, exasperating power struggles within his own guild. Elijah's first few chapters as prophet in Israel are all about establishing his authority. He dashes from one miracle to the next, saving armies and villages and children from terrible fates, although there is this one story when he loses patience with 42 boys who think it's funny that he's bald, which qualifies less as a miracle than a disaster story for everyone concerned. That's for another time. Elisha is presented as both powerful and compassionate, a man who stands up to kings and cares for the lost, even lost tools, or so the story goes. The company of prophets, his guild, apparently wanted bigger and better living quarters, and they began a building project on the banks of the River Jordan and set about chopping down trees. One of them, was so enthusiastic, he sent his axe head flying into the water mid-chop. It was an unfortunate accident, but also a minor domestic catastrophe. The axe was borrowed, the young man despondent. To calm him, Elisha cut down a stick, threw it in the water, and voila, the iron floated and bobbed to the surface. The young man retrieved his axe and presumably went forth to lead a life worthy of responsible tool ownership and meticulous maintenance. So what does the story mean? This is where the plot thickens and curdles in some cases. People are fascinated by this story. They find the characters compelling the metaphors intriguing, the fable-like quality, an, an irresistible lore. So here's a sampling from the wide world of early childhood curricula for Sunday school and internet blogs and library volumes. What's the story about? It's a story about lost faith. When we lose our sharp edge, when our axe heads become dull, we lose our effectiveness and the spirit's anointing and we need to ask God for help. No, what is it about? It's about, it's an admonishment about pride. When we borrow beyond our means, when we chop and build with tools that aren't ours, when our machines break down, there's still, a, a, we're, we're due for a fall that only God can redeem. Or, it's a story about, I love this one, technological process, progress. God blesses technological advances. When our ax heads sink and machines break down, they're still within God's eager reach. Or, it's a story about youth and age. Young people think they can do anything, but they can't, as experience inevitably shows. They need the wisdom and guidance of elders. Or, it's a story about disrupting sacred spaces. The River Jordan was off limits for new building projects. The company of prophets kept testing boundaries and losing ax heads as a result. Or it's a story that prefigures the crucifixion. The wood symbolizes the cross. The miracle of the ax is retrieval, symbolizes the miracle of Jesus' resurrection. Elisha is a prototype of Christ. The whole story points to the New Testament. You could go crazy at the wildly disparate interpretive choices you find, which truly seem to come from nowhere and bounce everywhere with unabashed enthusiasm. But perhaps a correct interpretation is not the point here. Maybe the point is the X factor, the fact that everyone is interested in the story and wants to participate. When the people are invested, they feel free to step in and speak up. They're at the table with us, engaged. They're excited to hear what's next. Some texts for preachers, they come ready built to enthrall. And others, we have to search hard to open. But what if the X factor is waiting to be discovered in every passage of scripture? 
What if a key to our people's engagement is simply the ringing of a faraway bell from childhood and the chime of recognition and the realization that, wow, this story too is one that wants our participation as much as the stories of Coyote or Anansi or Br'er Rabbit or Mother Goose. It's a place to start for preachers and the people we preach to. But first, you know what? They have to get interested in whether the axe will float. And the last one, the letter U. You want to guess? That was just almost impossible. What begins with U? Yeah, that would have been good. He had to come in later. I had to get to fit him in later, but I hadn't been able to fit in Abraham. If your name doesn't start with J, it starts with A. So you is for Ur. <laughs> Genesis 15. The ancient city of Ur was where Abraham was born and where he and his wife Sarah lived until Abraham's father declared he was moving the family to the land of Canaan. To be clear, this wasn't a hop to the next county. Canaan was more than 800 miles from Ur over mountains and rivers and deserts and a time zone. The little band set out, got as far as Haran before deciding to stop, settle down for a few decades. Abraham and Sarah didn't resume the journey to Canaan until many years later when they were in their 70s. That's like moving from New York to New Orleans with a long stopover in Nashville, or from Salt Lake City to Seattle by way of Sacramento. The mileage is about the same, I checked, but that last leg gets postponed until retirement. Abraham's passport, had he had one to present at the Canaan border, would have listed Ur of the Chaldeans as his birthplace and Haran as a long-term residence. They were the places that first shaped him and the locations he could point to when asked that most standard of small talk questions, where are you from? But where we're from isn't the same as where the Lord has brought us from. And Abraham came to learn this. One is a matter of geography, the other a matter of faith. One is a scattering of pins on a map, the other a line that moves purposefully between them. Abraham, or Abram then, may have been a man from Ur who had made Haran his home for many years, but the life he'd thought settled turned out to be a stop along the route of an itinerary he never set. God transformed the pins on a map into a narrative that was still unfolding. I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan. The Bible's first patriarch is a towering figure in the book of Genesis, a father of faith, of covenant, of nations. Abraham's life, his story, his devotion to God are held in highest honor as front man in the genealogy, his name is recited in prayer, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and recalled to memory in moments of divine address, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He and Sarah will become progenitors of descendants as numerous as the stars, God promises. His example will inspire believers of three world religions, his flaws will inspire theological reflection on the deepest levels. But of all we could say about Abraham, and it would take years to do these texts justice, perhaps one of the most important is simply the way he and God agree upon how to tell his story, that God is the one who brought him from Ur to Canaan. That this journey was much more than a few months on the road it would require a willingness to leave old certainties behind at every stop. That a life of faith meant trusting the itinerary to God and being ready to move, change, and change gates when called. And that the narrative unfolding was much bigger than Abraham himself. It was about what God was doing in the world for the world. The long trek from Ur to Canaan is a journey we all take 
in the life of faith, and preachers, seminarians, come to know it well. We begin as Abraham did. In the hometown context that first held and shaped us, Ur, as we've known it and experienced it. We're from there, but we can't stay there. God and ministry call, so we go forth on the way to Canaan. And it's a very long road to get there. It is much longer than we thought. Leaving Ur with all the change and painful growth that come with it is much harder than we thought. And Haran seems like it could be a nice place to stop. Not exactly where we were aiming to land, but halfway, thereabouts, maybe far enough for now. A person could do well enough in Haran, make peace with what is and the way things are and the stability of stasis, life that stays the same and preaching that keeps it there. If the narrative were just about us, we could live and preach that way for a good enough life and a close enough stopover, but it isn't. It's a narrative we join about the purposes of God. And to join it, we have to leave Ur and travel light. Leave old thought patterns rooted in barrenness. Commit to the long walk toward life and justice for all God's people with the stops and starts and struggles we have to stay engaged. Listen for when the next flight is called to get up and go from here. In Abraham, we meet a truth that often takes us by surprise. We are never too old or too settled in Haran to be interrupted again by God's call. Nothing is so fixed that it can't be reconfigured for God's purposes. Nothing is so stagnant that it can't be stirred into movement. Haran is a layover and always was. It's a stop on the road out of Ur. And God decides when it's time for the next leg of the journey, and for that matter, how much we can pack. Even the most enlightened preachers have old certitudes that no longer fit in those carry-on bags destined for Canaan. We will always be repacking. The distance from Ur to Canaan is more than 800 miles over mountains and rivers and deserts, and the endless stretch of our own human frailty. It's a long way to go, but an even longer way for God to bring us from the places that formed us through the places that need to form us still. And that's a good way to frame it when we tell the story. Wherever we started, however far we've come, God is the one who has brought us from there to here on the Canaan Road. Thank you.